Hello everyone, welcome to my channel. Um, today we're going to be doing another episode of Fruit Talk, and that is a podcast style uh, episode that I'm going to be doing on my channel every Wednesday at 9 o'clock Eastern, where we talk about fruits, vegetables, all things food, all things going on in the news, uh, frequent, frequent questions I get, or interesting things that I come across um, on a weekly basis. So in today's episode, we're going to be starting off with a particular fruit that I'm holding. If you guys can see this, does anybody know what this is? I'm sure some of you do. This is called a meddler. And these are meddlers here that, uh, a particular variety of meddler that this is, it's called Brita Giant. And it's a larger meddler than um, you're used to. And meddler is a weird fruit. Um, as it says here on Edible Landscaping, they're often referred to as loquats of the north because of their foliage and their furry-like leathery appearance. Um, they're related to pears, and they need to blet on the counter before you can eat them indoors. And what does blet mean? Well, it's basically getting overripe fruit on your counter, and they kind of become sort of rotten. Um, now this is actually what you're supposed to do with this fruit. You know, um, I like to have a lot of my fruits a little overripe. Uh, you know, the sugar content definitely increases. You know, you definitely get more flavors that way versus underripe. Uh, but this is, I think, to another extreme. Now, I've also been harvesting persimmons off my trees, and I believe that's a similar. I think that's the same term that your persimmons, your astringent persimmons. Have to go through is that they have to soften up and sometimes you can let them soften up on the tree um, especially if there's a frost that'll speed that process up but i i harvested my persimmons off of the tree to slow down that that softening bledding process i guess and um this is the first time i'm going to try a meddler and like i said it's it's breed a giant but to also comment on this fruit and why it's not really found that often is it's just a weird fruit number one number two um it's not really uh very large i mean it's it's actually pretty um popular in, in parts of europe like italy i think they actually grow these pretty frequently um but again they're not really something that is all that interesting or even that tasty uh people say I've heard a lot. They taste like applesauce. Man, this is not, there's no way this is good. It's, it smells fermented. Like, um, like a, like SWD or a, a fruit fly fermented, like this fermented and then the fruit fly got in here. I wonder if that's a thing. You can see what this looks like. It really is not palatable. This is just, I actually really don't want to eat this, but it's actually still a bit hard at the top, whereas the bottom is more fermented. Again, it's just, it smells like alcohol, like a fermentation smell. I'm probably going to spit this out. <laughs> I'm going to get something ready because this is not going to be good. Yeah, I don't think that's good. I'm not getting that applesauce sweet flavor. It's it's pretty much fermented at this point. I don't know. I can see why it's not sold in stores, but um, I'm sure it's interesting if you get it right, <laughs> if you get one perfect. But hey, that's Meddler, and that's the fruit. So. Next, I want to talk to you guys about um, actually pomegranates. And what I have right next to me is some pomegranate cuttings that I I took off my trees. Uh, I didn't prune my trees last year, but this year I did. And I just was outside pruning them and came inside and we bundled them up into these little bundles here. You can see how, you know, pretty they're pretty large, nice, thick cuttings. 
and they're very easy to root. And I don't think many people know that. I've actually never failed at rooting a pomegranate cutting. And I've gone through the crazy process of kind of uh, doing the similar thing that I've done with figs is try to find tastier varieties of pomegranates or more interesting varieties. And this is a really good PDF here. I'm going to put this in the description, I think. Um, this PDF really showcases some interesting pomegranates that come from uh, UC Riverside, I believe, is where they they have uh, kind of housed all these and, and are preserving them. And they're there, I guess, for educational reasons. But, um, you know, this is one variety here, Cerevene, that I have. And you can see through these pictures, really dark red arrows. Parfianca is another one that um, I'm also going to have available for sale, by the way. So we're going to put these cuttings on on Figbit. And you can go to the, the Fig Tree Cuttings. Well, actually, uh, it'll be in other fruit, non-fig related. You can see this guy's selling some pawpaw trees, mulberry trees, comfrey. So this will be in this section here. Rather than selling them on... Um, you know, eBay or something like that. This is a really nice website for not only the seller, but also the buyer. My friend Danny, who works for the NYPD, uh, he set this website up and he really did a nice job with it. Um, so I'm gonna be putting my, my pomegranate cuttings on here if anyone's interested in buying them. Um, but I've gone through the, the process of finding, you know, tastier varieties. Parfianca is one that is supposed to be uh, really is accepted as the tastiest like as as far as like the general consensus but there are even tastier pomegranates according to some um you know you can see the dark red arrows here what's nice about parfianca is that it's truly a soft seeded with very soft seeds and it's kind of interesting the textures that you get with these pomegranates some of them are hard seeded some of them are soft seeded and the only one we see in the stores is Wonderful. And Wonderful really is uh, is a great pomegranate, but there's many different flavors within these different pomegranates. There's also um, different hardness of the seed as well. So I think I think um, you know Wonderful somewhere it's considered soft seeded, but it's it's more considered medium. You know, uh, like Parfianca is really soft seeded. Whereas you have some other ones that we're going to show you guys that are mainly used for ju for juicing um, that are actually hard seeded. This is another one I'm going to sell or we're going to have listed. Gisarski. Um, there's also some pomegranates, guys. See how this one's more white on the outside? And the, the arrows are much lighter. Um, this is another one that actually a, a friend of mine swears this is the tastiest. And you can see this one has a citrus flavored grapefruit taste to it. Sweet tart. Um, there's different types, right? So some of them are just strictly sweet. So I'll show you guys. Here's wonderful. Purple heart is another one that I'm gonna sell. Now here's some uh, hard seeded types. And you can see these like Alcira Nar. This is one that I had because it was quite hearty. Uh, but this is mainly used for for juicing, you know. Um, best suited to juice. You can see that down there. And you can get some really interesting types that way. Here's one called uh, Haku Botan. We can get to this one and read about it. It's a white pomegranate. Um, extremely tart. So you get some that are all sweet, a balance of sweet and tart, and some that are extremely tart. And usually the color is actually uh, related to that. I'm surprised that the, the white one there is actually so so tart. And if we find one that's called Eversweet, if I do a search for that, um, I believe Eversweet is actually full sweet or mostly sweet. Let's see if I can if I can find a nice picture of this. So here's Eversweet. Yeah, very sweet, virtually seedless. So it's very soft seeded and it's very sweet. And the arrows 
are non-staining and they're they're um, they're actually white for the most part, white to pink. So you get some really interesting different things with pomegranates, and that's kind of what I wanted to showcase with you guys. We can go much more in depth with this, but um, let's move on. And I want to answer a question that Jerry uh, actually posted um, yesterday, and he said, "So what is the benefit of pruning immediately after dormancy?" versus waiting until March and then starting the cuttings outside. My guess, pruning makes uh, pruning early makes room for winter storage and starting cuttings early gives them a head start for the spring. And he's he's pretty much exactly right there. I think those are the two biggest reasons. And he's, he's referring to fig cuttings, but you can also do this with pomegranates. Like I said, I've rooted pomegranates over the winter time with a 100% success rate. And that's what a lot of people do is, I mainly prune my pomegranates um, one, to encourage spurs, but also two, because of storage reasons. Like I need to have my pomegranates that are in containers, move them into storage and have that at a certain height, right? If they're, if the pomegranate trees or the fig trees or anything I'm storing is too tall, well then that's a problem, right? So I cut back a lot of the height. We also did a video on pruning the pomegranates that I'm probably gonna put out sometime next week. Um, but that's a big reason, Jerry, is that, yes, we want to um, make room in winter storage. Um, also, it's a really great idea because so many people are making room for winter storage. Why not start them indoors? And why not start them over the winter time so that by the time the spring rolls around, you got a really nice plant going into the next season. It's kind of like starting seeds, right? You start seeds early, you transplant them out into your garden, and voila, you got a nicely uh, a nice plant ready to go for the spring. So it's a similar process, a similar reason, but I think the biggest reason why people do this, and you didn't mention this, is because of the environment. I think it's much more difficult to get a stable rooting environment when it comes to temperature, sunlight, and humidity outdoors than it is indoors or in a greenhouse. I can control the temperature and the humidity and the sunlight indoors, and I can control the, all that in a greenhouse as well. So, you know, it's much more difficult to set up a rooting environment outside, and I think that is the biggest reason. Not that you can't, and not that I haven't, but it takes a bit more effort and a bit more planning, I think, to do this outside in the spring. Also, one other thing, and this is why I wanted to answer this question on the, pod, the, the podcast style video here we're doing um, is because the answer is pretty long. It's not, it's really short and simple answer. Um, the last reason, I guess, is because if you prune now, your cuttings are slowly uh, losing moisture as time goes on. So if you wait till the spring, um, you could have moldy cuttings, you could have dead cuttings, rotted cuttings, dried out cuttings, um, you know, you name it. So Yes, you could wait and prune until the spring or just before the plants wake up. Yes, you could do that and then have fresh cuttings then. But again, um, you know, Jerry, that's a great question. And, and those are pretty much all of my reasons for, you know, rooting the cuttings in the wintertime. And that's mainly why I do it then. So I urge you, though, if you haven't done it, for those of you who are watching that haven't rooted something outside, give it a try see what happens so anyway guys that was the video that was fruit talk episode four i believe so we've been doing this every wednesday at nine eastern and uh i hope you guys 9 p.m eastern by the way i hope you guys can stay tuned for more videos on the subject um you know i think it's going great so far and i'm really enjoying this style of video if you are as well give me a thumbs up and uh, if you haven't already please subscribe um you guys can also follow me on facebook now um, and Twitter and Instagram, at Ross Ratty, the same tag as my YouTube channel. So, again, thank you guys, and I'll talk to you all soon. Take care.